Hey everybody, I'm Tony Rahm, technology reporter uh, at the Washington Post. Senator Cantwell, Senator Young, morning. thanks so much for being here on a rainy, rainy morning here. Uh, and for those who don't know, Senator Cantwell is Democrat from Washington State, Senator Young, a Republican from Indiana. Both are members of the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, which touches on artificial intelligence and many tech issues that we'll talk about today. Before we get going, just a reminder uh, that we will be taking questions from both the audience and uh, on social media. Just tweet us with the hashtag Transformers. I'll see it on my nifty little tablet up here, um, and then we'll ask your questions. But again, thanks for joining us. Thank um, you. Thank we have you. a lot to talk about in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. It is a very large field, but I would be remiss if I didn't start by asking you about the big news of the week, and that's Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. For those who missed the story, uh, Facebook is in a bit of hot water right now because Cambridge Analytica, which is a data analytics firm tied to President Trump, uh, was able to abscond with information from about 50 million Facebook users uh, it, perhaps without their permission or without their knowledge. We're now hearing calls for investigations and so forth. So given the fact we're having this conversation about the power of algorithms and machine learning and deep learning and so forth, I'd love to get your take on the news and what you think government should do from here. Senator Cantwell? Well, I definitely think we need transparency. My colleagues uh, have certainly, Senator Klobuchar and others, proposed legislation to make sure that we have fair and honest elections online. That is, that people comply to the same kind of laws that you have to comply to for advertising and information that we do in the broadcast world. So that's one aspect of this. And then the other aspect is just transparency. We need to know and understand how information is being used and what and who is behind that information. Obviously concerns about falsifying information in the, the, the bot realm of anything from uh, political use to you know information like on net neutrality at the FCC. Uh, those are things where transparency, how information is being created, transparency is very, very important. Senator Young. So uh, I agree with everything uh, Maria said. Uh, we need transparency with respect to what data is being collected. That's not always clear to users and how that data is being used. But I would also add, uh, we need to ensure there's accountability um, from uh, all parties in involved uh, in these uh, different decisions. And so Congress has an important role to play in ensuring if we don't have uh, clear rules with respect to accountability, who should be responsible for what, what trans transparency should look like, uh, then we need to optimize our existing systems. So on the note of accountability, should Mark Zuckerberg come testify on Capitol Hill? You both sit on the Commerce Committee. Should he come? Well, John Thune, uh, who is indeed uh, the chairman of the Commerce Committee, uh, I believe has invited him recently to uh, uh, come up here. So it would be my hope that we hear from top leadership. Uh, if Mr. Zuckerberg wants to appear, I'd, I'd certainly welcome his appearance. Senator Campbell? Well, there's a lot of people I'd like to hear from on this <laughs> yeah. thing writ large. So I, I think that uh, Mr. Zuckerberg should make himself available to discuss where technology is going in the future and discuss uh, the challenges that we face in this realm and add to the debate, not, not be silent on it. So to zoom out a bit, do you find that some of these companies, the leading cutting edge companies when it comes to artificial intelligence are black boxes, that you don't really know how the algorithms work, you don't know what the inputs are, and does that make it hard to do oversight from your perspective? I think we're entering an age where artificial intelligence is going to provide great benefits. If you look back to you know, the early days of the internet, there was lots of anxiety about what the applications would be, and yet here we are years later and we see the full power of it and how uh, unbelievable it is. You know, we probably a few years ago had the same discussion about drones and whether drone sh technology should be allowed, and yet we're coming to the precipices now where we see the advantage, whether it's fighting forest fires and having accurate information or a lot of different areas that it isn't about the technology itself, it is about the application. So I would hope that we would have the same approach to AI, that it is going to empower us, I think particularly in the area of cybersecurity, for a lot of great solutions. Do we have to have some discussions about how it plays out? Yes, and that is why Senator Young and I introduced our legislation, because we want government to be part of that discussion and to make sure that we are not only uh, taking advantage of the opportunities, but also looking at those questions of bias, which we know uh, will be there and on the table for discussion. So your question is sort of cuts to the heart of, of, of a very important policy issue, which is under what circumstances should we have full transparency, that is an algorithm 
made public uh, versus uh, uh, just accountability. That is accountability for whoever happens uh, to uh, have that algorithm available to users. This is one, frankly, that uh, I'm not equipped to be able to uh, offer my perspective on yet, which is exactly why Maria and I have put together the Future of AI Act. We see incredible potential in this technology. It, uh, it's already moving forward at a rapid pace in the private sector. Government is a bit behind here, and before we over-regulate it. We want to make sure uh, that uh, we get a better understanding of what sort of policy structures need to be in place so that people can meaningfully participate in a, an economy driven in large measure by AI uh, so that uh, it's not biased, as, as Maria mentioned, and so that hopefully America can lead with respect to this technology, which has the potential uh, to increase our rate of economic growth. Uh, I've been briefed by up to, uh, you know, doubling it within over just over 15 years. So, um, uh, your policy question, a good one. I don't think we have a clear answer on it yet. Sure. On the future of AI Act, which yeah. you had just mentioned, talk a little bit about the legislation. It's essentially a task force. Is that right? That's right. We, we house the task force at the Department of Commerce. Uh, we will convene uh, uh, data scientists, uh, members of, of the manufacturing industry, technologists, uh, and various other stakeholders uh, to advise members of Congress uh, and our federal government about what uh, the future of AI uh, legislative and regulatory policy should look like so that, uh, again, everyone can meaningfully participate, uh, be skilled up, uh, so that they can uh, fit right into uh, an economy driven uh, by AI. And also, uh, we want to make sure that people's privacy is protected and that these algorithms are, are unbiased. I mean, you, so, go ahead, Senator. Well, I just, I, I just adding on that, we, we wanted to look at four areas that we thought were important. One, what are the areas of competition that the U.S. should be mindful of given other people's investment in AI, whether that's China or other countries, and where do we fall into keeping our R&D prowess here, and what do we need to do to keep that going? I, you know, We're going from here to an energy hearing where I'm going to be very concerned about the level of cuts in the R&D budget for energy. The fact that people want to zero out RPE in this administration is just like crazy. So what do we need to do to keep the level of competitiveness. And then, as Senator Young mentioned, both privacy and bias will also be part of the discussion. And then, lastly, workforce. What are the workforce implications, and what do we new, need to do about that? Both in capturing, I can tell you right now, if you have any kind of AI education, please head to Seattle, Washington. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> the, the employers there are telling me, you know, it's, it's a very, very, very competitive field right now for anybody who has any expertise here, and it's just going to grow. So what do we need to do to both grow the workforce in this area, and uh, what do we need to do to prepare and diversify our workforce, too? So those are the four pillars of the legislation, and I think that we uh, are not saying that's the only thing to be discussed, but at least it gives us a framework for the important policies that are out there today. Sure. It, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I gather from that is that you think that some of your peers, perhaps in Congress and throughout Washington, maybe aren't equipped to understand the, the AI issues. They're not familiar with them. They're not talking to some of the companies in the way that you guys are. Is Congress equipped to tackle AI right now? Uh, I, I don't think we are. That's why we've created this panel. I, I like a measure of humility from my legislators, and, and this is uh, certainly an emerging field. And, and uh, what we need to do before we prescriptively regulate or legislate in this area is understand uh, what sort of challenges and opportunities are created by this technology, recognizing it's inevitable uh, that uh, we will continue uh, to have advancements in machine learn, uh, and learning and, and data science uh, and all the other uh, sort of subsets of artificial intelligence. What would you like to see from the Trump administration right now? I know there was that whole controversy about a year ago with Steve Mnuchin saying that it's going to be a long time before AI starts to have an impact on the economy. What would you like to see from the Trump administration on AI? Well, the last administration, the Obama administration, did a report and mm -hmm. came out with some basic uh, findings. One of them <clears throat> was the huge economic potential in AI for us as a nation. So I think that those ramifications need to be followed up on. Uh, that report, I think, outlined some areas in which we could all agree that uh, we need further investment. To me, I think maybe we're even talking about an, an AI 
Engineering Institute, similar to what exists now at Carnegie uh, Mellon for software, you know, something that where we're going to talk about standards, we're going to talk about certification processes, we're going to talk about, you know, a lot of the issues we just discussed. So what is that next phase of development and then what are following up on what are some of those applications that best are suited to us at the federal level, those applications that are going to help us, uh, whether it is cybersecurity or disaster relief issues, you know, data, big data information. Driven. It kind of bugs me that that the Europeans on the weather forecasting, just because they use supercomputing uh, for their algorithms, are constantly producing better data on storm and storm impact than we are. So what are we going to do to stay uh, competitive on some of these important issues? So I think the Trump administration should take the Obama administration recommendations here and go further on that investment. Now, I don't know where the president is on science. If I could, you know, do anything, I would give him a little tattoo right there, science, because I think uh, I think he needs to put a more down payment, you know, on on these areas. But that's that's again a very northwest perspective of you know kind of view of the world. Senator. Well, um, I would start with the recognition that uh, contrary to conventional economic belief. Um, Countries do compete, not just firms. And there's a competition in the realm of AI right now. And, and so we, we need to make some strategic investments as a country in particular technologies. And AI strikes me as, as a natural one based on our existing expertise uh, in both data science uh, and supercomputing. You mesh the two and, and you get artificial intelligence capabilities. So um, we need to make some strategic bets. Um, those, uh, once we decide what those bets should be, uh, we need to invest in those uh, particular areas. Uh, I don't think it's uh, a real obstacle uh, that the Trump administration hasn't been prescriptive in this area. I actually uh, welcome it. As a member of Congress, I think it's great that we have an opportunity to legislate in this space as opposed to uh, having very little interaction with the executive branch, which is what I experienced uh, during my six years in the House of Representatives. So um, I see this as an opportunity, and, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's a good opportunity for bipartisan work, uh, and that's what Maria and I are doing with this uh, AI legislation. Sure. Let's talk about the industry and some of its policy challenges. I'm struck every time Elon Musk gets on stage and talks yeah. about how AI is akin to nuclear weapons. I think he said it could cause more damage than a nuclear bomb. He, previously, he's talked about going to Mars to avoid whatever catastrophe AI may cause here on planet Earth. Uh, when you hear statements like that from somebody who works in this field, in this industry, what does it mean for you from a policy and political perspective? It's whichever one of you wants to take the question. Well, I think that uh, we can all go a long way and have, and lots of, there's probably been many a movie about this already, <laughs> right? So uh, just as I said earlier about other technology applications, the issue isn't, are you going to move forward on technology? The issue is, what do you want to do about those applications? I'm kind of struck by the same discussion we had over the last, I would say, 15, 20 years about stem cell research. Mm -hmm. And yet, right now at the University of Washington, we're making regenerative heart tissue. So I'm pretty sure I'm glad that we had the conversation. And I'm pretty sure I'm glad that we moved forward. Now, was there a lot of question about what stem cells were going to be used for and trying to you know, have a broader debate? Yes, but I think this is the issue with AI is that, uh, well, Alon can bring up some very important issues. That's why we want this legislation, to have mm -hmm. that discussion and to have that consideration. So I think that we have plenty of time for that. <laughs> Senator, do you agree? So I think that was a good example. I, I think those uh, previous conversations about other difficult issues allowed us to uh, achieve at least a measure of consensus on what was in the beginning an incredibly difficult issue. And, and now we're starting to identify uh, a lot of consensus in that area and therefore medical breakthroughs. So, um, in, in the area of artificial intelligence, which I, I, I think is, uh, frankly, it's an anthropomorphic uh, term. Uh, maybe we should just call it sort of gap filling, gap filling our existing capabilities. It is another tool. 
Um, it's a tool that sometimes makes people uncomfortable because the notion of extending uh, one's intelligence and augmenting it uh, for whatever reason makes us less comfortable than extending our physical capabilities like one would with a hammer or some, something else in the physical space. And um, so we need to normalize that idea and also recognize that like, as with any tool, it can be used for good or for ill. And I would hope that uh, this panel that we've convened through the uh, Future of AI Act uh, would consider some of, of these contingencies as well to put the public at ease and also to prepare for uh, the potential of, of using uh, AI, not just for those wonderful things we've talked about, doubling the rate of economic growth, increasing the productivity of a worker uh, by up to 40% in just over 15 years, uh, but also uh, addressing concerns people have. Sure, we saw some of the potential perils of, of the automation side of all this just yesterday with reports that a self-driving car operated by Uber uh, had killed a woman in Arizona. This is coming at a time when Congress is considering legislation that would put more self-driving cars on U.S. roads. Is this an example of people reacting too strongly to something that happened, or is this, you know, case in point, maybe Congress needs to slow down and think a little bit more before it does something like put more self-driving cars on U.S. roads? Senator Campbell? Well, we're definitely going to get her first of all I'm so sorry for the loss of a life in Arizona and to that woman's family so our sympathies go to them we'll hear from the NTSB about what that accident was about and the details and uh, I've read some reports from the Arizona newspapers about uh, what they think has been the experience with these cars that that people feel like in some of these areas they actually have worked successfully to stop accidents from happening. So we need to look at all the data and information. <clears throat> That's why we have this oversight. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you from the aerospace industry that the technology-driven cockpit has provided us more safety and security. It has improved the ability and performance of our airline industry. So again, we want to move ahead with things that are going to help us provide more safety and security. But yes, we have to get to the bottom of what was the detail in this individual instance and, and area and what do we need to do uh, to resolve any of these issues. It's not as if we're not going to have problems. Mm -hmm. There are things that are called software glitches and they can have serious consequences. But again, is the question of is that do, how do we move ahead? And our job and oversight and particularly whether it's NIST or uh, the Department of Transportation is to make sure that we are not putting people in undue risk by not having that oversight and structure when it comes to the implementation of new technology. And that's the job we do in talking to those agencies about that oversight responsibility. So as you can imagine, we had a lot of discussion with Toyota mm -hmm. about their cars and what was a software glitch. And yes, it was complex, very complex, to the point we have to get, I think you're hearing from NASA later today, but I think we actually had to get NASA to tell us what exactly happened in that instance. So the complexity of this, because it's going to be related to software and software algorithms is going to be harder. Okay, well then let's set up an agency and the proper people here to understand it. We don't want to be the laggards on AI at a government level where an industry is moving forward and we have no real ability to do our oversight responsibilities. That's why I think you know something like an AI institute, mm -hmm. engineering institute to help the government just as we do right now on FAA issues is probably a proper role and responsibility. But, but culturally speaking, are Americans ready for software glitches where the consequences or the repercussions might be the loss of human life? Of course not. And so, of course not. But at the same time, if that technology drove into the cockpit of an airplane better safety standards and better measures, which is, I think, what people would tell you today has happened, mm -hmm then yes, we want to keep improving for safety standards. We want that help and information. And so it's not an either or situation. It is what is the responsible oversight role for us to play and making sure we have people at the federal level who have the ability with a basic understanding of the technology to actually oversee it. And I think that is probably right now where we're missing a little bit of, of uh, if you will, uh, technology umph here to make sure that we are building that because it's such a new area, such a new area. 
So as we adopt new technologies, uh, there is unquestionably a higher standard uh, for those technologies than the existing technology. I, I just think we have to recognize that. Mm -hmm. In this particular instance, this tragic incident, uh, of course, we feel for the family. Um, our prayers are, are with um, the young lady's family. Um, but um, we, we, we also, as policymakers, I think, need to provide some context when we talk about these things. In 2015, nine out of every 10 auto fatalities in this country happened on account of user error. We can improve on that. And that's what uh, aut autonomous vehicle technology aims to do. Uh, this is safety technology. And uh, as it's developed, uh, there, there uh, will likely um, uh, be some uh, unfortunate uh, uh, mishaps uh, along the way and we, and we need to do everything we can to put in place a regulatory structure, a legal structure to make sure that's not the case. That's why uh, the AV Start Act, mm -hmm. which uh, we've, we've passed out of the Commerce Committee, I hope is, is soon put on the President's desk and signed into law so sure. that we can create a proper regulatory structure for development of these technologies. Sure. One of the other consequences when we're talking about AI, it always comes back to job loss, the potential for job loss. And I was struck, as I was doing research for this, I, I, you know, I stumbled upon a Gardner report that said by 2020, AI could wipe out 1.8 million jobs, but then generate 2.3 million jobs. What role does Congress have in retraining Americans so that they're able to pursue those 2.3 million jobs that AI helps create? Education, education, education. Is Congress going to pay for it? Are they going to put the money in? Well, first of all, we need to do all we can to drive down the cost of education. Uh, Senator Collins and I have a bill, the first ever federal incentive for apprentice, because we think we need to skill and train so many Americans. As I talked about cybersecurity, it's already clear we need 1.5 million new energy workers, a big chunk of them in cybersecurity. So we already have this problem today. In fact, I personally believe that the challenge of our era is the transitioning nature of our economy that is going to continue to change. I always say to people in my office, there's a reason Ma Bell doesn't exist anymore. But then the young people are like, who's Ma Bell? Oh. <laughs> they don't even know. And so the fact that we've gone from a behemoth in telecom to now this handheld device is a major transition. But that is going to happen in every sector. The newspaper industry, uh -oh. what have you been through? <laughs> okay, so it's going to happen. I believe you prepare for that. And one of the ways you prepare for that is to upgrade our education investment. Sure, you can make it more efficient, you can help drive down the cost, but we have to prepare a system that is going to allow us to skill and train people for those new jobs and to be able to help us capture the economic opportunity that's there. Senator. We also need to uh, change how we train uh, for careers and for jobs. McKinsey Global has, has done some interesting work in this area. They looked at 800 different job categories. Uh, they found that uh, their estimate is that one out of uh, 20 jobs will, will go away entirely uh, as AI technology develops. Mm -hmm. But 60% uh, of those 800 job categories will see a portion of their job be automated through AI technology. So that suggests, yes, some workers will have to be entirely retrained, uh, and we need support systems and public investment to ensure those support systems are there for uh, retraining into new job categories. But we also need what I would imagine would be more compressed training regimens for those workers uh, whose uh, the nature of their existing job will change. So we're already seeing uh, colleges and universities, uh, many private programs, uh, offering six-week programs, 10-week programs, um, as technology continues to evolve to prepare people uh, to uh, be on the cutting edge of their giving, given profession. And uh, there's some creative things we need to do as well, because the cost of education is, has gone up, we all know, over years in, in college debt and so forth. So, uh, for example, I offered legislation that uh, uh, would allow private investors to invest uh, in students, whether someone wants to major in electrical engineering or data science uh, through a standard four-year curriculum, or a 12-week uh, coding program, private investors could pay for that student. The student would then pay back the private investor after completing uh, the program of study, thus shifting all the risk of non-completion onto the private investors uh, and only, only uh, putting a debt burden on, on that student should they 
uh, land a job on the back end. So um, these are the sorts of creative things that I think you'll see emerging increasingly uh, as, as we adapt to this new normal of education yeah. and training. One of, one of yeah. the ideas that's been proposed yeah. is this idea of a robot tax, right? Whether it's Bill Gates or folks in California, there's been conversation about whether you tax robots or other forms of technology that take the place uh, of, of a job currently held by a human. Is that one of the ways that the federal government can help pay for retraining? Well, this is probably an area we might disagree, but uh -oh. I'm so grateful. <laughs> I'm so grateful to have my colleague here and to work on this together. But yeah, I would have taken the tax bill and put a big down payment on retraining. I mm -hmm. would have. I, you know, the even on the repatriation discussion in the past, we'd talked about saying that some of that should have gone for retraining. Now, do I think the public and the private sector are in this together, and that companies are pretty motivated here too? Yes, but. I do think that this, as I said, is one of our biggest challenges is how to accelerate this right now. So to me, I would use whatever incentives we could because it is, it is what is going to help us with the productivity uh, wage uh, growth. I think Seattle has had something like 2.3. Uh, so we're one of the cities in America that has actually seen that wage growth but you're going to have to make this investment. So let's figure out the most cost-effective ways for the public and private sector to partner together to drive that down. But what I would have, would I put that on the table instead of some of the other elements of, of the of the tax bill? Yes, that's that's what I would have done. Senator Robot Tax? <laughs> yeah, I, I would not start by taxing capital investments, which is what this is, a new form of, of, of capital investment. Um, we could have also taken, uh, and Marie and I might disagree on this, the stimulus package and invested heavily in, uh, in worker training. So um, I, I think we both agree on a bipartisan way that worker training is essential uh, in this new hyper dynamic economy we're in and um, uh, we're, we're gonna find ways uh, to adapt to the new sort of training that's required. Sure, we have just about a minute or so left, so I don't wanna leave before we touch on one last issue, which is bias uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. It's one of the things that the Obama administration had warned in its final report about artificial intelligence, this potential for prejudice to be embedded in the code itself. What role does Washington play in this space? Does it force companies to, to change their hiring practice? What, what, what can Congress do here? Well, we, we need a robust discussion. We need a robust discussion, just as we had one, as, as I said, about stem cell research. We, it, one of my biggest complaints right now is on capital formation for the SBA and the amount of capital that, or so little of it, that goes to women and minorities. And why is that? I mean, they had like 4% of SBA capital, some ridiculous <laughs> number, and you're thinking, why is that? So what's the bias there? Well, when you peel it back, you find lots of different things. Women like smaller loan amounts, and the programs aren't geared towards them, or the counseling that exists you know, are geared towards not the same applications as women startups. So there's a whole bunch of issues there, but is that a bias? Yes, it's a bias, it's a problem. And do we want somebody to bake a bias into uh, a algorithm? No. Right. And we are going right. to do our best to try to figure out what is the proper role to make sure that doesn't happen. But I guarantee you, there are so many biases that exist today in other policy, and we have to keep in mind that that the broadest discussion, that's again why I think an institute, these international stand, like an IEEE or other organizations that help us discuss, you know, standards for electricity. Uh, you know, electronics and other areas are important tools for a broader discussion. And we should empower somebody like with our task force to have that discussion so that we can come up with some ideas and parameters about this. Sure, that, and that, that unfortunately is gonna have to be our last word on this because Senator oh. Campbell's gonna run and I'm okay. gonna get the hook. Uh, but thank you both for keeping Thanks for, uh, so much for having coming us. Coming Senator Young, thank Senator you. Campbell. Yeah, thank you. Thank Great you. discussion. Thank and thanks you. everybody. Thank I'm gonna you. kick this over to Drew Harwell, my colleague.